morning. Good to see everybody out this morning. We are studying in Matthew's gospel account. We're at the end of chapter 25 this morning, if you want to turn your Bibles there. Matthew chapter 25, we started discussing uh, the, uh, not necessarily a parable, in verse, starting in verse 31. We read through it last week and started to discuss it. We'll finish that thought up this morning, hopefully. Good to see everybody out. I'm going to ask Patrick Winhorse if you would lead us in prayer. Thank you. So let's remember the context. Jesus, uh, he's actually not in Jerusalem. They've left, uh, left or their city uh, and gone back up on the Mount of Olives on their way back to Bethany. Uh, it's noted in the Gospels that uh, when Jesus came into uh, uh, Jerusalem uh, on the 10th of the month uh, with the great crowds uh, uh, basically hailing him as the king of, of the Jews, that uh, he went into the temple uh, at that point and don't know how, for sure how long he was there, but they left. And it tells us in the gospel accounts that he would go back up to Bethany, which is up on, on the uh, other side of Mount of Olives uh, to the east. So it's generally thought he's uh, they're either stopped on the Mount of Olives before Bethany or at Bethany at this point. But uh, we discussed in a lot of detail Matthew chapter 24 and his discussion with them when he, he had told them that the, no stone left of the temple would be left on top of the other, which of course would have caused no ma- a great amount of curiosity and excitement and, you know, what in the world is he talking about? And so he explained uh, exactly what he meant when they asked him, uh, when, was, when would this happen? What would the sign of your coming be in the end of the age? And he answered that, all three questions, and he finished that thought up and he gave them some parables to teach them about, A, you don't know when this is going to happen. There's no date on a calendar that's fixed for you. Not even, you know, nobody, not even the angels in heaven or the Son, just the, only the Father knows when I will be coming back. And he reminds them first to... Uh, be like the wise servant who's been left in charge of his, his master's house and all of his possessions to take care of things and be ready. He says, because, you know, if you know what time a thief was going to break into your house, you would have been prepared for him ahead of time. So I want you to be prepared ahead of time. And so I'm leaving, and he gives the uh, uh, parable of the wise and faithful servant to teach them that you can't be a slug about this. Always be busy about uh, the master's work, taking care of his possessions and his servants. In the second parable, he says the kingdom of heaven is going to be like ten virgins who took their lamps to go out to meet the bridegroom and used up a parable of something they would have understood, a wedding from everyday life and the customs that were in place back at that time in that part of the world to teach them about being prepared because if you weren't prepared for uh, an unknown coming, you're going to be left outside the door, and they'll tell you at the door, hey, I don't know you, and you're going to be left out, and that's going to be the end of it. The third one, he says, again, it'll be like a man going on a journey, calling his servants to entrust his property to them. We talked about this last week, where the master gave the servants in accordance with their abilities and rewarded them in kind when he came back, and teaching uh, them and us to not be lazy with the gifts that God has, has presented us with, but to make use of them to make an increase for Him. And uh, he calls the one, uh, the third servant who only had one, was only given a single talent to take care of, and all he did was uh, go and hide it so he wouldn't lose it. Didn't use it, didn't put it to use, didn't do anything with it. Uh, so he did not follow his master's instructions, and he's called lazy and wicked, and that's what he was. 
And so he was, not only was his talent taken away from him and given to the uh, one with five talents who had increased his master's wealth great by double, but he cast him out of his service. And it's not coming back in. And again, teaching, teaching the apostles and us today that we're going to be given things to put to use for our master. When we call Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior and our master, that has a lot of weight behind it. If you say that he's your master, that means that you've agreed to serve him. He gives us all different, uh, different uh, amounts of, of what we call gifts or talents to be used in his service. And he rewards those who use them. And he will not reward those who, who put them aside and bury them because they're afraid to use them. We talked about that last week. And then he follows that up with this last part. Again, I, I, don't, I don't count this as a parable. He's actually telling them, hey, this is what it's going to be like. I mean, I guess you could say um, the use of uh, a shepherd separating the sheep and goats, one from another and separating. But we saw last week where uh, when Son of Man does come in all of his glory and his angels with him there in verse 31, He's going to sit on his throne in heavenly glory. and uh, All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, and he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. And starting in verse 34, you get to see the character of those on the right and those on the left, the sheep on the right and the goats on the left. The sheep are what the master considers as the righteous, and the goats on the left, we see as we read through this, are, are the unrighteous and the wicked. And there are, there's criteria for the separation. So he says, The king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance for the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. We talked about this, is where we left off last week, I think. God's planning. And Paul refers to this a couple of times in his letters as he writes to the church about a, you know, a kingdom that was put into place and a plan that was put into place before the worlds were framed. God already knew before he created this universe and the people like us that inhabit it, he already knew what was going to happen. And he devised a way to end the separation between us, the created, and him, the creator. When, we, when we're done with this existence. That's a plan that was in place before creation. And Jesus refers to that right here in saying that uh, a kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. But then he goes into the criteria for who is counted, and counted off as a sheep and goes to his right-hand side. And who are blessed by my Father. You're going to see two different things here in this between the sheep and the goat. Blessed and cursed. There's no middle ground. You're either in the group that's blessed or you're in the group that's cursed. So he says, For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. In verse 35, I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. And I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous, there again, now there's where we see where the sheep are counted as the ones that are righteous by Jesus' own words. The righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you as a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for me, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Did you see anything in there about having... Uh, uh, the spiritual ability, the, the spiritual gifts from God to perform miracles to raise the dead, heal the sick, uh, prophesy things that will happen in the future, or give a special message from God. Did you, did you guys see any of that in that criteria? Raise your hand if you did. I don't, I don't see that in there. What do you see, Kevin? What are the things that he, that he says in there? What exactly did, were, was the criteria? It's really everyday things that anybody can do. Feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, invite a stranger in to take care of them, feed them. 
clothe those who don't have anything, look after and help the sick, in prison come and visit the prisoners. There's no special really gifts or talents that are needed to accomplish any of those things. What's needed to accomplish those things? Hmm? Compassion. The will to do it. Compassion, and but also the will to, to uh, uh, act with that compassion. Have to have the will to do it. That kind of goes really back... Uh, it goes along with the parable of the talents because we all have different gifts of administration to show mercy, uh, encouragement, or whatever. Again, we read uh, Matt, uh, Rome, Paul's child, uh, letter to Rome last week where he talks about that in was it chapter 10, about the gifts that can be used and how they should be used. And a lot of, and a lot of the gifts he talks about were not special spiritual gifts. They're things that we can cultivate ourselves. It also goes back to uh, the very first parable he taught about the wise and faithful servant who the master put in charge, and uh, this is in chapter 24, verse 45, who is the wise and faithful servant whom the master put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? That's one of the jobs that the servants of the master has to do, not only to feed the, the gospel, but to take care and to look after the servants, fellow servants. And that's something that, again, does not require special, uh, supernatural spiritual gifts to do. This is something that we all can do. And they make the point, Lord, we didn't see you like this. I mean, you know, in their, in their humility, they say, you know, Lord, we didn't do this. We, we're, we, we didn't do that. You're giving us credit, too much credit. And he says, no, he says, when you did any of these things for the least of my brothers, you were doing that for me, doing that to me. And again, practicing, you know, back when uh, Jesus first came into Jerusalem for this uh, Passover, and all the testing between him and the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the Jews there in the temple, and he was asked, what was the greatest commandment in the law? And he said, there's two, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two commands. Both of those commands are met if we, if we do these things. It is about furthering the word of God and making new disciples for him and increasing the kingdom. But part of that is not just preaching the gospel. It's how we treat our neighbor, our fellow man. And we learn from the, uh, uh, Luke's version of, the, uh, of this uh, question about the greatest command, the parable of the uh, Good Samaritan. We're, we're not supposed to out, be out there looking at, well, okay, she's my neighbor, but she's not. So I, don't have, I, can do, I have to do good to her, but I don't have to worry about doing good to her. That's not the way we're supposed to look at it. We're supposed to consider that we're supposed to be the neighbor to everybody. So that's what we should be doing is good to all. Any questions or comments? Keep in mind, this, you know, you're saying that might, makes me think of this. Who's his flock? The people who, who have called on him to be ma master and he their servants. And you've got servants here who have done what they said, that what was said, you know, they said they would do and they did it, what they were supposed to do. Even though they didn't realize, they, you know, they didn't see Jesus and do this to them. They did it for his brothers and so did it to him. Then you've got the other group there who said, you're my master, but, okay, we didn't see you, Lord, so we didn't do any of these things. If we'd seen you, you know, we would have done it. But you're right. You make me think, uh, you know, the once saved, always saved. 
and those that believe that way, starting with Martin Luther, who scratched James, the book of James, uh, the, he, the letter he wrote out of the Bible simply because of what he said by you showing you my faith by my works. And uh, all James is saying pretty much throughout his letter is very much just a small distillation of what Jesus preaches in the Gospels. How to righteous living. And showing that we have faith by the way that we comport ourselves, our work, so to speak. Understanding that that does, is not what wins us a home in heaven. It's just simply our, our uh, actions and reactions towards God and our fellow man, understanding that we are his servant and have been given gifts to make use of while we're on this earth. The verse that they quote in Ephesians, Paul's letter that says, you know, we've been saved by, faith, uh, by grace through faith, not by works lest any man boast, but then further on down from that, a couple of verses down, it says, you know, you were created for these works in righteousness. Hey, we're supposed to be doing these things if we are faithful, if we have faith. Now, that's a good point. Any other comments? So then he uh, turns and looks at the ones on his left, the goats. Depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. There's a lot there in that verse. First of all, the ones on his left are the exact opposite from the ones on his right. Those people are not blessed. They're cursed. Uh, they're do, they're, they're uh, judged to damnation. So he tells them, away from me, into the eternal fire. That word eternal is the uh, Greek word for perpetual. Anywhere you see for uh, a lot of times where in the uh, translations eternal or forever, uh, that's the same Greek word. It's, ev it's everlasting. It's all, it will ever and always be. So he says, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So there's a kingdom that was prepared for, for the creation of the universe for the righteous to be with God. But there's also been prepared an eternal fire for the devil and his angels. And here's where we, you know, if you didn't understand that Satan, you know, if he thought Satan was working all on his own, here's where you find out for sure that he's not working all by himself. He has his own messengers. That's what angels are, angelic beings who are messengers of uh, deity. Uh, not a lot else to say about this. Just understand that the devil's not going to be alone in his, uh, in his uh, damnation and also his eternal resting place but he's going to have a lot of people with him that aren't human beings. He's going to have uh, spiritual beings that are already reserved for the same judgment as him. But he tells them, You're, you are going to this place because I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. But they also answer like the first group, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? You know, I didn't see you. Where did we, we looked, we didn't see you. And he says, I tell you the truth. And again, there's that uh, Greek word, amen, verily. Uh, it's, it's real, whenever he gives you that phrase, he's wanting to make an emphatic point. And he wants you to get it. Whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. In other words, you should have been looking out for my servants. And when you didn't look out for them and do those things to my, the least of my servants, you didn't do it for me either. Again, going back to these other parables where Jesus is telling him in advance, you know, you don't know when I'm coming back, when I'm going to arrive again. You better be busy. You better be watchful. You're my servant. Be my servant. Then these will go away to, again, there's that word eternal, which is perpetual, to eternal punishment, but the righteous, again, the perpetual uh, uh, word there, to eternal life. And so with that, uh, that pretty much finishes his thoughts. And, um, you know, I can't imagine, you know, after having been told uh, you're in the temple and pointing all these things out to Jesus of the, the ornate building that uh, was built uh, with the works begun by Herod the Great and was still going on to the day, this day, in the Bible, and you're told by your master, you see all this, it's not going to be one stone left on top of another. 
And so, you know, arouses great curiosity with, within the group. And when they get back up on the Mount of Olives, they go to him and ask him, what did you mean by this? You know, when is this going to happen? And when are the signs of your coming and the end of the age? And he goes through all that, and then he tells them this. And he's, you know, he's just two days away from being betrayed and crucified. And he doesn't have a lot of time left to uh, teach them and be with them and comfort them and get them ready for when he will be gone. And so this, I mean, this is a lot to uh, take on. And, you know, we see that they still don't fully get it until they receive the Holy Spirit uh, in Acts chapter 2. But uh, they, were, they were told some pretty good lessons here about how, what their master expected of them. And we've been left the same narrative. And there's a reason why we have it. We're expected to, to uh, we, don't, we don't have the, the supernatural spiritual powers, but we don't need them to be able to accomplish God's will for us. We just have to, to use what we've been given. Even as something as, you know, we sing that song, you know, just a cup of cold water in his name given. It really is that simple. Make use of your talents and do good for others. Uh, try to take care of your, your brother. Any questions or comments? Matthew chapter 26. Uh, Drew, would you read 1 through 5, please? Okay, so he finishes his discourse and he tells them the Passover is two days away. So this would be, depending on whose th train of thought you use on when the actual Passover, uh, the evening uh, twilight of the uh, 14th of Nisan was, uh, whose who's, uh, out outlook you look at, but this would be Tuesday sometime, Tuesday afternoon before evening. So it's two days away and he tells them again and this time he's pretty straight about it. Son of man is not just going to be killed. He's going to be handed over to be crucified, which to them would have meant something because everybody knew what crucifixion was back then and how horrible it would be. So, again, another warning. Time is short. And so at this point, somewhere in this, in this uh, point, uh, I would say probably after Jesus and the disciples left the temple on this day, uh, there had been some really, really rough uh, bumpings between Jesus and all of the uh, leading Jews. All of the sects and the, and the chief priests tried to come in and, and trip him up in front of the crowds at the temple on this day, earlier in the day, and were just repeatedly humiliated. And then he laid on them the, the seven woes on the Pharisees to, uh, to even amp it up more. So as you can imagine, they are ready to be done with him. So they meet, the chief priests and the elders of the people of Sinai, that would be the Sanhedrin. They meet and they're going at the palace of the high priest, who at this time was Caiaphas. And they uh, plot to arrest him in uh, some deceptive way and then kill him. So they said, you know, it's, we got to get rid of him. But then they're worried. And they don't want to do it during the feast or there may be a riot among the people. Why is that? It's pretty obvious that everybody that was there, most, most of the crowds uh, he had on his side. Uh, and you're doing those kind of miracles, and then uh, you're being challenged by the leader, your spiritual leaders, and he answers them back perfectly and just leaves them with a, on their face. You know, they can't answer back. You know, guess who the crowds are for at that point? But crowd, you know, everybody knows this. Crowds are fickle. Crowds can turn on, on something or somebody and just like that. And they'll end up using that to their advantage. But they're worried that they might cause a riot, so they can't, they, they fear arresting him right there at the temple and during the daytime in front of all those crowds and hauling him off because they're afraid they'll start a, a riot. And if a riot starts, Rome's going to get involved. And if it's bad enough, if Rome gets involved, guess who loses their place? 
the chief priests and the Sanhedrin. They'll have they'll they'll rip them out and they'll they won't have anything. So they they want to be careful and they're worried about this. So but they've been thinking about this for a long time. But Jesus has pushed them into a corner, so to speak, with what happened in chapter 20, 22, 23, and 24. He's really put it on them, and they're going to have to do something. He didn't, he didn't leave them any choice, and that was by his design. He had to die according to the Scriptures, be crucified. And he's pushed it into their lap so hard that they are ready. They want him. They want to get rid of him, and they're going to. Six through... Uh, the next account takes place back in Bethany, uh, 6 through 13. Brandon? All right, Ma uh, thank you. Uh, Mark and John also have parallel accounts, and this actually kind of brings up a little bit of dispute among scholars about uh, the timing and, and where everything happens here. So Jesus, uh, in verse uh, 1 and 2 there, he says, The Passover is two days away, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. But then down in verse 6, it says, While Jesus was in Bethany in the home of a man known as Simon the leper, is there anything in there that tells us that it was exactly on that day that this took place? Not really. Kind of leaves it open in it. And, and you can, if you look through Matthew and Mark, and even Luke and John, you'll see that not, every, not necessarily will everything always be in chronological order. So uh, it, this could be an instance where Matthew goes back and tells something that happened earlier in the week, uh, especially since it's not really, he doesn't really specifically say that evening or that night or the next day. He just says while he was in Bethany. And again, if you go back to uh, earlier in Matthew to where we saw that uh, Jesus and the entire crowd came into Jerusalem for the first time for this Passover, when he left the city that evening, it tells us he's staying in Bethany each, each night. So at some point this happened in Bethany. It's just that you would have, you don't necessarily can say that this happened that night because it's not specific. Now that comes into play when you look at John's gospel account and he talks about the same thing happening in John chapter 12. And he has it happening sometime before, maybe before the two days before the Passover. So let's look at John chapter 12, starting in verse 1. Six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor, and Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at table with him. Then Mary took a pint of pure nard and expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair and then the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume so and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As a keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. So we see it's pretty decidedly it's the same thing happening here. Now, uh, scholars will say, well, this happens actually happened six days before the Passover instead of two, like Matthew and Mark say. But even this does not decidedly say what day after Jesus got to Bethany, what day of the week or how many days before the Passover this took place. It just says that he arrived at Bethany six days before the Passover, where Lazarus lived. 
and whom Jesus had raised from the dead. It simply says that here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. It doesn't say what day of that week or weekend or the following uh, week, Monday, Tuesday, or whatever. It doesn't say what day that actually took place. Any more than uh, Matthew and Mark say what day when he was at Bethany that this feast was given for him by uh, Simon the leper. It doesn't tell us, so we don't know for sure. It's not really important. I just want you to be aware, you know, there is some controversy amongst scholars, you know, this is a uh, contradiction in the Gospels. Well, it's not really, because neither of the three writers are explicit on what day this feast took place. We get some more information on, on a couple of things out of Matthew and Mark, and then we find a few more things out in uh, John. One thing we find out is uh, from Matthew and Mark, it's at the home of Simon the leper. Uh, that's Matthew and Mark at these spots. It's the only place where you're going to hear that uh, person named. His name was Simon. He lived in Bethany. He probably was uh, well enough to do that he could afford to have a feast at his house. And uh, he, had, he was a leper or had been. Most people think that he had been a leper and he was one of the people that Jesus had, uh, had uh, cured miraculously. So when he gets back to Bethany at some point, he, uh, he, gives, he gives a feast for him, and Lazarus is there, his friend whom he raised from the dead. And we've seen earlier in the gospel accounts that Jesus was especially close. You really get that sense out of John's gospel account that they were really, really tight as a family. He had two sisters, Mary and Martha, who were also devoted to Jesus, very much so. And uh, so, again, we see in John, Martha serving, and then uh, while they're reclining at the table, Mary, the other sister, comes in with about a pint of pure nard. Um, I don't know much about uh, perfume anyway or any of that kind of stuff. Um, it's just that uh, this uh, nard was a special mix or blend. It was really pricey. You see it mentioned in the Old Testament. I know it's mentioned in Song of Solomon's, uh, Songs of Solomon. And, uh, but it's, uh, it was really well known as an expensive ointment or uh, 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 just used. You know, back then, you know, they didn't have Sure or Dial or anything like that. And bathing habits weren't, you know, they didn't have pipe showers and things back then. Things like this were used for body odor and keep everybody, you know, really nice smelling. And this happened to be a particularly expensive version of it, Dior, I guess you call it, Dior of the day, Stetson, it wasn't Aqua Velda, I don't think, but it was, it was very expensive, you know, the, it was noted that this was about a year's wages, that would be 365 denarii, so that's a lot of money, and comes with, a, it's in an alabaster uh, receptacle, which also would have been expensive. So she comes, and we find in Matthew's, Mark's account, she pours it on his head, which would have been, you know, start there. That, that was a sign of, of great respect, but an even greater sign of great respect is what John said she did, also did with it. She poured it also on his feet and then wiped his feet off with her hair. That's very servile. I mean, can you imagine getting down on your hands and feet and washing somebody's feet off, and then I don't have enough hair left to do it. Back in my mullet days, I did, but I don't today. But, I mean, that's very, you know, subservient and very showing great, great respect. And Jesus made note of that. And uh, all you have to do to, to know about Mary's faith is look back at a couple of chapters before this when uh, Lazarus, her, her brother, died and what, what she stated to Jesus. But uh, she goes to this great expense and great uh, show of, of servitude and respect for Jesus. And it says in Matthew and Mark, the disciples speak up about wasting money by doing this to Jesus. And Jesus lets them know right away they better shut up. It's, it's none of their business. And they tell them in Matthew, you know, why are you bothering this woman? She's done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you have with you always, but you're not always going to have with me. And she did this to prepare my body for it for burial. I don't know if he means that the Holy Spirit somehow moved her, that, you know, this, uh, this is your job. 
you're going you're gonna to anoint your master for burial. I, nobody can say that for sure. But she was moved to do this some, uh, for some reason. But Jesus says she did it for pre- preparing his body for his burial. And he says, because of this, and there again is that phrase, I tell you the truth, verily or amen. He's really emphatic when he looks at these disciples and makes this point. I tell you the truth, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Here we are almost 2,000 years later, and we're talking about her. So that was a faithful woman. That's something to emulate. So she, I guess you could say she, she actually was able to say, if she's there with the sheep on the right, and uh, he, he, uh, he says, you did this for me and me and me, she was one of the ones that actually was able to look at him and did something special for him. So that's pretty cool. So he tells him, you know, just lay off. So she's done something for me and prepared me for the day of my burial. We find out in John's account, it wasn't necessarily all the disciples that were going on about this waste of money. It was one disciple in particular, Judas Iscariot. And John is one of the ones who kind of in retrospect, and I, don't, I think there's one other place where he says something about, the, about Judas, but Judas was the one who, who uh, kept their money back to, uh, you know, they, they didn't have any money. They left their jobs. But uh, various women helped take care of their needs, and the money that was used to do that, I guess Judas was the one who kept the bag to keep that money. And we find out from John, he didn't say that because he cared about the poor. He wanted that money to go in the money bag because he was a thief, John tells us, and he used to dip into the money bag for himself. And so that's all he cared about. And so um, I would say that I guess that was probably the last trigger so to speak, that moved, uh, that Satan used to move Ju- uh, Judas to do what he did to Jesus, to betray him. Because it's not long after that that he does that. But anyway, so God thought this was an important enough thing to happen and to show, I guess, this is a great example of servitude and, and humility. That this woman was willing to spend a lot of her money to do something like this for the Lord, to honor him and prepare him for, even though she may not have even understood what she was really doing until Jesus said this, but she did it anyway. And to the point where she even got down on her hands and feet and put it on his feet and cleaned them and wiped them off with her hair. That's, that is humility to the core. And Jesus honored that, and the Holy Spirit did, by making sure that we knew about it from three different accounts. And two of those accounts, uh, the Holy Spirit tells us through Jesus that I want everybody to know about this. Down through the years, I want everybody to know what this woman did because it was special. Any other comments? 14, 15, and 16. Kevin? Okay, so one of the twelve, Judas Iscariot, is the one. So this sounds like just right after this happens, he sees the opportunity to leave the, the group, and he goes back into Jerusalem and goes to the uh, chief priest. And uh, I don't think any of the versions say anything about the Sanhedrin or the elders. I think he goes straight to the chief priest, and he's, he, get, he carves out a bargain with them. You know, what are you willing to do for me if I, if I want, find a way to hand him over to you? And Judas would have, you know, one of the, especially the 12, would have really been the one to know, where can we get this person? Where can we arrest him and, and sneak him off and uh, kill him and not have any crowds around to stir things up for us and, and uh, cause, you know, the Romans to get involved on, the, on this behalf? Judas would have been the one to know and, and turned out to be the one willing to do it. And so they count out 30 pieces of of silver, 30 uh, shekels of silver. This fulfills uh, prophecy. 
If you go to Zechariah chapter 11. In Zechariah, uh, God talks to Zechariah and tells him to... Uh, he, he, he's basically going to call out especially the uh, elders and the chief priests of the people because they're, they're shepherding the flock in, to damnation and destruction. And they're acting like that they don't need anything. They don't need God because their lives are full. They've, they've come out of the Babylonian captivity. They have the temple and the city again. And they don't need anything. We don't, you know, we don't need anything at all from God. And so he has him shepherd a flock doomed for destruction and as a show to the, uh, the Jews there in Jerusalem. And as part of this, in verse 12 of chapter 11 in Zechariah, I told them, if you think it best, give me my pay, but if not, keep it. So they paid me 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, the handsome price at which they priced me. And that's, that's irony and sarcasm right there, folks. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw it into the house of the Lord uh, to the potter. That just took place as far as Judas is concerned and will take place, finish out after Jesus dies. We'll see uh, when, when Judas sees what happens and realizes how bad it, it is and that it's not just he's going to be arrested and taken away. They're going to murder him. He, re, he is sorry for his actions and he takes the money back. He didn't want anything to do with it. So and we'll see that here pretty shortly. But uh, it's pretty cheap. A person's life, 30 shekels of silver. It was even a lot, even a lot less than the uh, the alabaster p uh, pint of nard that he was just complaining about, that uh, Mary uh, broke over Jesus' head and on his feet. So he was actually pretty cheap to get, wasn't he? What are we willing to give our soul away for? What's what's your price? What is our price? What's my price? Think about that. So, you know. Yeah, we didn't portray Jesus. I think about what the Hebrew writer said about, uh, you know, we've become Christians and then we go back to the way we were. What are we doing to the Son of God? We're trampling Him underfoot again. So that's uh, it's kind of, kind of uh, hard to take and think about sometimes. So we'll pick up uh, in verse 17 next week. Appreciate your comments and attention.